which is an attempt to both commemorate the dead and the injured of the First World War, which of course the anniversary of which is next, uh, is next year in 2014, but also to state unequivocally that we don't want future wars and that we should use this commemoration to campaign for peace. Uh, my name is Lindsay German, I'm the convener of the Stop the War Coalition, and my, my organisation, along with a num number of other organisations and individuals, came together a few months ago to establish the No Glory campaign. We did so because we were very worried that the government would be using this commemoration in order to justify war, in order to glorify war, and in order to use it as the reason to try to justify future wars. And it's worth remembering exactly what the human sacrifice was in this war. You will all have seen the Cenotaph, which is a national memorial, war memorial, which was built in the years after the First World War. Originally, that Cenotaph was a wooden uh, construction, and it was a temporary. It was meant to be a temporary construction. And so overwhelming was the grief of people so many people came to that same time to pay their respects to their dead loved ones, to their injured loved ones. The number of flowers that were placed there was so great that they decided they would have to build a permanent memorial. And we should remember that was because in this country alone, three quarters of a million people died during the course of the First World War in military combat. Many more died as a result of, or were injured as a result of wars, there was a terrible influenza epidemic at the end of it. This was a human catastrophe, and Britain was by no means the worst affected country. That in France, in Germany, in Russia, and in a number of other countries, the casualties were even, were even greater. So, we want to say tonight that we want to remember those dead, we want to remember what happened in the First World War, but we do not want a rewriting of history which tries to portray this as a war which was in some way justified, to try to portray the generals as in some way justified, and to try to portray what went on as some kind of war for democracy, because that is not what the peoples of Europe thought at the end of the war. It is not what the war poets, some of whom you'll hear from tonight, thought in the course of the war. It is not the feeling, it was not the feeling of millions of these soldiers and their relatives who, who, had, who committed the supreme sacrifice, and we want to reflect that. Perhaps most importantly, this still has resonance for us today. At the end of the First World War, the various treaties that were established actually helped to create a world where future wars then became much more common. It was called the War to End All Wars, but in the ensuing hundred years, we have seen even worse wars, even more casualties, even more terrible things. Many of those wars have been exported away from Europe to other parts of the world, and of course now, whereas the vast majority of casualties in the First World War were military casualties, now the vast majority of casualties in every war are civilians. And therefore, these are things that we really, that should be a very, very good reason to ever go to war, and I don't believe that in most cases the government has had a very good reason to go to war. And I was reminded only in August of this year where it looked as though there was going to be another war in the Middle East, another intervention by our government and by the United States and by France in Syria. A war which they talked about doing despite the fact that the Iraq war had left half a million, a million dead, nobody knows, had left millions of refugees. And that moment in August where it looked like there would be war reminded me of some of the periods before the First World War where suddenly all the major powers begin to position themselves and begin to make war look absolutely inevitable. If we are to commemorate the people who died a hundred years ago in the way that they should be commemorated, then surely our job is all also to oppose existing and future wars that are going on in the world. And that is one of the reasons we've launched the No Glory campaign. I hope you will support it. You'll be hearing from a number of people tonight about the importance of it. And I'd like once again to welcome you and to introduce our first uh, performers who are John Landor, Imaistri, and George Slavichka, uh, who are going to perform uh, the Lark Ascending, the Ralph Williams uh, 
piece. So please give them a very, very warm welcome and I hope you will enjoy these.
Hello, good evening. I'm very, very uh, proud and happy to be here to be one of the first concerts and fundraising events of its kind. Um, my sister is going to be joining me in the second half, and I've also got another sister there, my brother-in-law, so practically the whole family is supporting this event tonight. Um, I'm going to start by reading um, the last post by Carol Ann Duffy, the Poet Laureate who was one of the first people to support this campaign. It's called Last Post. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If poetry could tell it backwards, true, begin that moment shrapnel scythe you to the stinking mud. But you get up, amazed, Watch bled bad blood run upwards from the slime into its wounds. See lines and lines of British boys rewind back to their trenches. Kiss the photographs from home. Mothers, sweethearts, sisters, younger brothers, not entering the story now. To die and die and die. Dulce, no. Decorum, no. Pro patria mori. You walk away. You walk away. Drop your gun, fix bayonet, like all your mates do too. Harry, Tommy, Wilfred, Edward, Bert. And light a cigarette. There's coffee in the square. Warm French bread. And all those thousand dead are shaking dried mud from their hair and queuing up for home, freshly alive. A lad plays Tipperary to the crowd, released from history, the glistening healthy horses fit for heroes and kings. You lean against the wall, your several million lives still possible and crowned with love, work, children, talent, English beer, good food. You see the poet tuck away his pocketbook and smile. 
If poetry could truly tell it backwards, then it would. Now uh, this next poem is by Wilfred Owen, who attended the wedding of Robert Graves in 1918 in this church. And later that year he died out at the front, I think he was 25. Uh, this poem was published posthumously, it's called Strange Meeting. It seemed that out of the battle I escaped down some profound dull tunnel, long since scooped through granite which titanic wars had groined. Yet also their encumbered sleepers groaned, too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. Then, as I probed them, one sprang up and stared, with piteous recognition in fixed eyes, lifting distressful hands as if to bless. And by his smile, I knew that sullen hall. By his dead smile, I knew we stood in hell. With a thousand fears, that vision's face was grained, yet no blood reached there from the upper ground, and no guns thumped or down the flues made moan. Strange friend, I said, here is no cause to mourn. None, said the other, save the undone years, the hopelessness. Whatever hope is yours was my life also. I went hunting wild after the wildest beauty in the world which lies not calm in eyes or braided hair, but mocks the steady running of the air, and if it grieves, grieves richlier than here. For by my glee might many men have laughed, and of my weeping something has been left which must die now. I mean the truth untold, the pity of war, the pity war distilled. Now men will go content with what we spoiled, or, discontent, boil bloody and be spilled. They will be swift with swiftness of the tigress. None will break ranks, though nations trek from progress. Courage was mine, and I had mystery. Wisdom was mine, and I had mastery. To miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled. Then, when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels, I would go up and wash them from sweet wells, even with truths that lie too deep for taint. I would have poured my spirit without stint, but not through wounds, not on the cess of war. Foreheads of men have bled where no wounds were. I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I knew you in this dark. For so you frowned yesterday through me as you jabbed and killed. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. Let us sleep now. Um, this is a poem by Teresa Hooley, who um, was born in 1888 died in 1975 and wrote most of her poetry in the early 20s and 30s, maybe 40s, but she was mostly known for this poem, which was possibly one of the very few poems that women poets wrote at that time against the war. So it's called A War Film. She'd actually, I think, seen a documentary about the war and um, the Battle of Mormons, and she wrote this poem afterwards. <clears throat> I saw, with a catch of breath and hearts uplifting, sorrow and pride, the weak's great draw, the mons retreat, the old contemptibles who fought and died, the horror, the anguish and the glory, as in a dream, still Hearing machine guns rattle and shells scream, I came out into the street. When the day was done, my little son wondered at bath time why I kissed him so naked upon my knee. How could he know? The sudden terror that assaulted me, the body I had borne mean mine, my, nine moons beneath my heart, a part of me. If some day, 
it should be taken away to war, tortured, torn, slain, rotting in no man's land, out in the rain, my little son. Yet, all these men have mothers, everyone. How should he know why I kissed and kissed him and kissed him, crooning his name? He thought that I was daft. He thought it was a game and laughed and laughed and laughed. And this last poem uh, is written by Patrick McGill, an Irish poet. Uh, he served with the London Irish Rifles. He was wounded at the Battle of Lewes, October 1915. This poem was written in May 1915, in the trenches. Um, for the purposes of this poem, please ignore my jacket, because it's quite a cockney piece. So just imagine I'm wearing a Pearly King outfit, and uh, we'll be fine. This is uh, Matey by Patrick McGill. Not coming back tonight, matey, and reliefs are coming through. We're all going out all right, matey, only we're leaving you. God, it's a bloody sin, matey, now that we've finished the fight. We go when reliefs come in, matey, but you're staying here tonight. Over the top is cold, matey, you lie on the field alone. Didn't I love you of old, matey, dearer than the blood of my own? You are my dearest chum, matey. Go, but your face is white. But now the reliefs have come, matey. I'm going alone tonight. I'd sooner the bullet was mine, matey. Going out on my own. Leaving you here in the line, matey. All by yourself, alone. Chum are mine, and you're dead, matey. And this is the way we part. The bullet went through your head, matey. But God, it went through my heart. heads up an organisation called Musicians Without Borders in Holland and they did a lot of musical reconciliation work in Bosnia after its last terrible war. But this song is from way back, nobody knows who, who wrote it. Um, and it's two lovers uh, who are miles apart from each other singing to each other and she says, she is called Dula and she says, oh my Osman, where are you now? And he's singing miles away, Dula you must forget me, we have all been captured, I'm in chains, my horse is dying, forget me, you'll never see me again. <coughs>
Good evening, Jeremy Corbyn, MP Chair of Stop the War Coalition. Firstly, that was incredible music. Thank you very much indeed. And to hear Lark ascending to say that perform so beautifully in this church was an amazing experience for me and I'm sure for everybody else. So can we renew our thanks to the orchestra for this evening? This event didn't happen by accident, it happened because a lot of people got together to organise something called No Glory. And I want to thank all of those, and in particular I want to thank Jan Wolfe for putting all this together. <laughs> and now that she's suitably embarrassed, she can relax for the rest of the evening. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. When we sent a letter to the Guardian in May, uh, the Prime Minister had announced that it was going to be a commemoration of the First World War and it was going to be a celebration like the Diamond Jubilee. And then went on in later statements to say that the government was going to spend £55 million on this celebration and that it would show Britain at its best. Well, anyone with the remotest understanding of history, the remotest understanding of the depths of the despair, the misery, the poverty, and the loss that descended into every community all across Europe during and after the First World War would never use such language. War memorials in Germany, in France, in Britain, in Russia, Italy, and so many other places all tell stories and I have a uh, particular reference I want to make. There's a very interesting book that was published some years ago called, by a man called Ken Weller, Don't Be a Soldier, the Radical Anti-War Movement in North London and he describes the incredible levels of poverty that existed in my borough of Islington at that time. And also the way in which, in the run-up to the First World War, remember that the working class had lost many in the Boer War, and indeed there's a war memorial to the Boer War in my borough, and I was looking at it today, and it said, they died for Britain in the South African War. It's quite a hard thing to get your head around exactly why these young men all had to die in a South African War, the main beneficiary of which was uh, Rhodes and a few others. Um, and then the propaganda developed, both for the peace movement and for the anti-war movement. And I quote from a recruiting leaflet which said, and this was um, a discussion leaflet, shall we say, a good soldier is a blind, heartless machine at the word of command, he will put a bullet in the brain of the bravest and noblest men who ever lived. He respects neither the grey hair of age nor the weakness of childhood. He's unmoved by tears, by prayers or by argument. He's indifferent to human thoughts or human feelings. Don't be a soldier, be a man. And that was a very telling letter that was published at that time as a way of encouraging people to begin to think and understand something about those wars. And when you look at war memorials all over Britain, and we'll be looking at them in a few weeks' time, if you look at them carefully, you see whole families, the names, all the same family, all perished in the Somme, in Passchendaele, all over the Western Front, in the Dardanelles, or in so many other battles. Then you ask yourself the question, what was it all for? The propaganda was that Germany had started the war, Germany was a warlike nation, Germany caused it all. Well, Britain had been involved in quite a few colonial wars, France had been involved in a lot of colonial wars, Germany had been involved in a lot of colonial wars, so had Russia. The death toll ran into millions, the war machine was born, the industrialists made millions out of that war. Surely, that isn't something to celebrate. That's something to understand how the world descended into the madness of the mass slaughter 
of the finest of its youth on all sides. So how do we respond to this? I think we respond firstly by commemorating all those who died on either side, any, any side. Understand the implications of that war. The Treaty of Versailles that calmly carved up so much of the world in the interests of the victors. So many of today's problems descend from the Treaty of Versailles and the victors' justice that was meted out at that time. But we as a country still spend 35 billion pounds per year on arms. We're the fourth largest arms expender in the world per head of the population. We've spent 30 billion pounds on the, my view, utterly disastrous wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then in the bombing of Libya. But I think all of us that protested on all those wars have made a difference. It was to me um, a strange moment to be in Parliament when for the first time in my memory, Parliament said no to a Prime Minister who wanted to take us into another conflict. Parliament said no. They said no because they were frightened of public opinion. They said no because they can't afford it. They said no because they didn't know to where this particular conflict would lead. What war in Iran, what war all across that whole region. So, in no glory, we need to do a few things. One is to recognise that peace is not just the absence of war. The causes of war are greed. The causes of war are inequality. The causes of war are the pressure of those that make so much money out of war that push politicians into taking this into war. So justice is the first thing. The other is to recognise the wars that are going on at the moment are the first world against the third. Drones, high technology, very expensive, quite brilliant pieces of equipment, killing villagers who can't do anything other than be killed by these drones coming. So let's draw the lessons of the First World War. Use this opportunity, provided to us kindly by the Prime Minister with the expenditure of £55 million pounds of our money, to ask people to think differently, to ask people to think of an alternative world where we don't spend £35 billion pounds a year on weapons of destruction or nuclear weapons of mass destruction. Instead, we look at the causes of conflict and look at the opportunities and possibilities of peace and say every child deserves a hospital, a doctor, a school and a home. Every adult deserves to be able to develop their lives and work. Instead, we consign some to die in the Mediterranean trying to survive. We consign others to die at the hands of a drone aircraft. Let's bring humanity into this and promote a serious discussion. That indeed is what No Glory will try to achieve during our next uh, year and a half or however long we're in existence. I've got a feeling we're going to be around for a long time after that. So I want to thank you so much for coming along tonight and now hand this stage over to Alice McGonagall. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I'm up in the pulpit there, watch my P's and Q's. Um, I'm going to do three poems uh, about current and recent wars. The first one concerns the Black Watch, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. It was subsumed in 2006 into the, uh, the Royal Regiment of Scotland, it's the 3rd Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Scotland. Um, in the First World War, uh, the 2nd Battalion of the Black Watch were deployed in Mesopotamia and Palestine. And a little over 10 years ago, uh, the Black Watch found themselves back in the same part of the world. And in October 2004, they were controversially deployed to the southwest of Baghdad in Camp Dogwood, known as the Triangle of Death, uh, to free up American troops to flatten the city of Fallujah, a city of about 300,000 people. This poem is entitled, Turkey Shoot. They deny it's a political decision. They insist it's a military request. 
They just need a few Scottish soldiers to die at George Bush's behest. Doomed youth from Dundee and Dunfermline, Blagowrie, Kirkcaldy and Perth. They've got you over a barrel of oil in the Mesopotamian earth. You're a thin tartan line off kilter laid bare with a fig leaf of Downing Street lies so that US Marines can break hearts and lose minds in the name of McFreedom and fries. Thus, the Red Hackle rises west of Baghdad, the Black Watch have been here before, and the river Euphrates is foaming with blood, now Babylon's burning once more. Star-spangled rockets fracture the night, the minarets shatter and fall, the city of mosques is a boneyard, only ghosts heed the Muezzin's call. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. The cry from a death rattle trap hell bent on a joyride to God we are bomb blasting metal and flesh into scrap. Charred carcass heaps high in the desert, laid to waste for American greed as democracy sinks in the quicksands of fear and you smell the foul stench of this deed. But you're caught between the devil and a sea of pitch black gold. A sacrifice to the petrol pump price, your honour is tarnished in soul. Still, they say they'll disband your regiment, you're the Queen's own disposable jocks. Then they promise you'll be home for Christmas, and you will, gift wrapped in a six foot pine box. World War I was, as we all know, the war to end all wars, and Woodrow Wilson said it would make the world safe for democracy. That's a familiar rhetoric. And um, the rhetoric of politicians justifying their decisions to go to war is often empty, and indeed they mangle the language so much that it almost becomes meaningless. This next poem concerns the war in Afghanistan. I honestly don't know really what we've been doing there. This is called Operation Undying Conflict. We're going to get the job done. We're giving it a final push. We're dropping bombs on goat herds up the Hindu Kush. We're exporting Western values. We're making the streets of London safe and sound. We're importing heroin and body bags. We're driving fear and loathing underground. We're liberating the oppressed. We're defending democracy. We're installing freedom through force. We're neutralizing insurgents, we're pacifying targets, we're seeing it through, we're staying the course. We're only causing collateral damage, we're implementing extraordinary rendition, we're operating surgical strikes, we're accomplishing a just and stabilizing mission. We're reconstructing a broken nation, we're building Jerusalem in Afghanistan, we're tramping through the blood-sodden poppy fields with the ghost of Genghis Khan. We're in a struggle for civilization. We're on a crusade against medieval vandals. We're tweaking Johnny Taliban's beard. We're stamping on his sandals. We're employing enhanced interrogation. We're imposing prolonged detention. We're pouring water down throats. We're punching heads. We're kicking the Geneva Convention. We're turning back the tide of terror. We're wearing King Canute's crown. We're trundling Sisyphus's rock to the top of the hill and we're watching it roll back down. We're chasing wild geese across the Khyber Pass. We're sifting dust in the Tora Bora. We're on the Silk Road to nowhere. We're opening a present to Pandora. We're harvesting death in a blighted land. We're staring into Pandemonium's cave. We're wrapped in the flag of faded hope and old glory. We're stumbling into Empire's grave. We're slowly sinking in the sand in a Soviet tank. We're unsheathing Darius of Persia's sword. We're putting new saddles on the same old donkeys. We're severing reason's golden cord. We're tying ourselves in a Gordian knot. We're weaving an endless reef. We're climbing a mountain to catch a fish. We're seizing the moon by the teeth. We're ruffling a kangaroo's feathers. We're knitting with fog. We're nailing jelly to the walls. We're putting socks on an octopus, we're ploughing the sea, we're grabbing eunuchs by the balls. Alexander the Great, Blair, Brown, Disraeli, Cameron, Obama, Brezhnev, Bush. We're dropping bombs on goat huts up the Hindu Kush.
banging the drum for intervention here, there and everywhere, and despite the horrors that were unleashed in Iraq. Last month alone, I believe, a thousand people died from bomb attacks in Iraq. Anyway, this poem is called No Regrets. Hand of history on his shoulder, the Lord Almighty's armchair shoulder, been that soldier, been there, done that, Richard Older, Mr. Blair has no regrets. Well groomed, perfumed, well healed, well fed, his thoughts and prayers with England's dead, plastic poppies strewn upon his bed, Mr. Blair has no regrets. No doubt, no qualms, no shame, no guilt, no crying over blood that spilt, Team America to the hilt, Mr. Blair has no regrets. Hidden weapons, fairy story, evil monster Jack and Ori sang the bugle of vain glory. Mr. Blair has no regrets. Bad tyrants must be toppled over. What a lovely war, Jehovah. Let's all sing White Cliffs of Dover. Mr. Blair has no regrets. No, you'll no regret rien, monsieur. Combat Edith P.F. Bon Viveur. Full metal jacket suits you, sir. Mr. Blair has no regrets. Phosphorus burning in Hell's Forge, uranium rising in the gorge, cry God for Tony and St. George, Mr. Blair has no regrets. Walking wounded, widows on their knees, screaming orphans, shell-shocked refugees, slaughter, torture, butchered amputees, Mr. Blair has no regrets. A hard rain falls like molten knives on husbands, mothers, sons and wives, a thousand, thousand wasted lives. Mr. Blair says he regrets that bit. Eden turned to an endless song, daily Baghdad bus queue bombs, grim visage, peace, salam, shalom, Mr. Blair has no regrets. Cocooned in money for old rope, his soul whitewashed in holy soap, more infallible than the Pope, Mr. Blair has no regrets. He'll fight them on his tropical beach, in gung-ho after dinner speech, on, on, once more unto the breach, Mr. Blair has no regrets. Thank you for listening. Absolutely superb. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Last thing is before you go, uh, before you go out, but please be back in 15 minutes. We have copies of this uh, pamphlet, booklet, written by Neil Falconer, No Glory, The Real History of the First World War, with this wonderful reproduction of a Paul Nash painting on the cover. Uh, I remember seeing it for the first time when I was 14 on a trip to London, a painting by Paul Nash, and it's stayed with me ever since. That haunting image of the sheer destruction of war, of everything. And he painted brilliantly and has done so much to make people think about the real consequences of war. So please buy this as you go out. It's four pounds and it's available just as you go through the door. Thank you very much, 15 minute interval. an honour to work with so many different organisations, peace organisations, anti-war organisations and so many extraordinarily committed individuals who are giving of their great talents to support this very, very important campaign. The way war has been conducted has changed enormously over the past hundred years. As Jeremy said, we now have drones, remote killing machines, we have nuclear weapons which have already killed hundreds of thousands and they hang over us with their terrible threat of mass destruction. But we know that also, no matter how much the nature of war changes, the sorrow and the pain remain the same. And that's why we continue to campaign in our diverse ways to bring about an end to war. The centenary is a great challenge for us. It's a challenge for us to 
oppose the glorification, to break down the dominant discourse, the dominant narrative about war and the splendours supposedly associated with it on a nationalistic basis. But the centenary is also a great opportunity for us to continue to work together and also to work together internationally. I can tell you that we are working with peace organisations across Europe, from France, from Germany and from the Balkans as well. And we're planning towards a big peace festival and youth festival in Sarajevo next summer to bring people together with the hope of peace and for a culture of peace in the eve, on the eve of the centenary of the First World War. So out of this terrible catastrophe and our government's determination to present this tragedy in a celebratory way, we nevertheless are making the most of the opportunity to pull together for peace here and internationally. So can I welcome our second half? We're going to hear, first of all, again from Sally Davis, Matthew Crampton, Abby Coppard and Tim Coppard. One of the songs in that first section will be Sally Davis's own arrangement of the bridge by Edward Thomas, so that will be a particular treat. And then after the music, Matthew Crampton will be reading My Dad and My Uncle by Heathcote Williams. So please welcome them all. Thank you. to start with an English folk song called Lovely on the Water, which um, is very old, and again it's to two lovers talking to each other before he goes off to war. It mentions our queen in it, and it's, that's Elizabeth I.
We have a double whammy, if you know. We have the same poem, first spoken, then sung. It's The Bridge by Edward Thomas. <coughs> and sadly, like many of our contributing writers tonight, Edward Thomas was killed in action on the first day of the Battle of Arras in Easter 1917. Sally has put these words to music, and in a moment she'll sing them with Tim and Abby. And the music will go straight on from when I finish reading the poem. But first here, The Bridge by Edward Thomas. I have come a long way today on a strange bridge alone, remembering friends, old friends. I rest without smile or moan as they remember me without smile or moan. All are behind, the kind and the unkind too. No more tonight than a dream. The stream runs softly, yet drowns the past. The dark lit stream has drowned the future and the past. No traveller has rest more blessed than this moment brief between two lives. When the night's first lights and shades hide what has never been. Things goodlier, lovelier, dearer than will be or have been. <coughs> I have been a long way today. A long, 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 long way today. On a strange bridge, on a strange bridge.
We're most lucky, Edgar Williams wrote a special piece for us tonight, which I shall now read. It's about his family's involvement in the First World War. My dad and my uncle were in World War I. At least they were in it, but not in it. Conscripted, but never committed. My dad was caught up in 1915 and then run over by a field gun in an army camp at Lidmarsh in Kent. So he never actually made it across the channel to fight. His pelvis and both legs were crushed in his first week in a training exercise by a howitzer rolling downhill. It weighed over 30 hundredweight. While pushing and dragging the gun up a slope, my dad and the other 18-year-olds carried shells, shells to be fed into the howitzer's six-foot-long barrel. One of the group lost his footing, and they lost control of the gun carriage. Then two were crushed by its cast iron wheels, each wheel being the height of a man's shoulder. One of them died, but my dad survived. As a child, I was ashamed of the story, naively wanting him to be a hero. But of course, if he'd never been invalided out, I might never have come into existence. There were a thousand howitzers on the Western Front, heavy, Swedish-made guns towed along by boys, men, and horses from battle to battle. By the war's end, those howitzers had fired 25 million shells, stealing thousands of lives and generations unborn, making the gun crews primary targets. My Uncle Jack's connection to the war was stronger than my dad's, as Jack saw action. He made it across the channel in a Royal Artillery troop ship and lost the use of a limb in 1916. His arm was half severed by shrapnel. He held it in place until it was patched up, and then he was returned to his unit with a flask of iodine to dab on it. Jack was in one of that war's most famous battles, one of those whose very name makes you well up. But Jack ran counter to the received wisdom about the soldiers serving in the Great War, with its sentimental patina and its mythologized tales of Nurse Edith Cavell and the Angel of Mons and lions led by donkeys and plucky Brits, because my dad's elder brother never really participated either, and he certainly never gave it his all. Jack had reservations, that's how my dad put it. More often than not, Jack didn't have one up the spout, meaning he'd avoid putting a bullet in his gun, because with a dodgy arm, it was a nuisance to load it. And when his hands were freezing, he just thought, sod it. It was easy to escape the corporal's attention. And Jack said, there were many others who did the same. Hundreds. If not thousands, Jack always claimed, men whose instincts told them to do the minimum. Jack won the military cross, <laughs> but not for that. He won it for dragging their sergeant major back into the trenches from no man's land, where the sergeant major was lying wounded. Jack's commanding officer came to know of it, and Jack was mentioned in dispatches the army's understated way of saying that he'd shown courage in undertaking his one-armed rescue. Though as far as his fellow soldiers were concerned, Jack's exploit had been a waste of time, for their sergeant major was unpopular, and in any case, he was dead on arrival. <laughs> Jack lived with the taunts and the ribbing about his gesture having been pointless, and was even accused of doing it to show off. Cripplingly shy, this was a knife to the heart, and it lasted long, long afterwards. Jack never picked up his military cross, and whenever a family member mentioned it, he dismissed it as a, a putty medal with a wooden string. As a child, I never quite knew what that meant, but apparently it was a common expression, applied to the top brass when they visited the front when they strutted up and down, martinets with black gloves and swagger sticks, fact-finding desk jockeys from the war office, clanking away with their rows of flash medals and drawing attention to themselves. Those below in the dugouts would mutter, 
putty medals with a wooden string. Your Uncle Jack lost all his friends in the trenches, my dad would say, and he's never made any ever again, and it was true. I never saw Jack with a friend. I saw him throughout my life, but he was always alone, except for his sister Mabel, who looked after him. He never made another friend in over 50 years. Neither he nor my father ever explained the war to me. It was just something that had happened to them, something irrational that hung over them, a grisly cloud of spectral blood, a tumor that fogged the psyche, something in their history that had spoiled both their lives. Stoically, they never admitted to the pain. But looking back, my dad was always in pain, and Jack could be painfully silent to the point of catatonia. Even though they were little more than children, they'd been forced to endure a random, excruciating pain that had confiscated parts of their bodies, bodies that had been their birthright. But afterwards, each was able to exact a small but significant revenge by their both giving the war some 50 years of unremitting negative spin. <laughs> they scoff at those who try to romanticize it. They'd never buy poppies for their buttonholes, and on Remembrance Day they'd say that there was nothing worth remembering. To my father, the Senator was a monument to Jack's hell, a traffic hazard, he'd say when we drove past it, and he'd curse it. That dreary Lutyen's plinth, with its floral life belts laid beneath it, life belts that save no one's lives, propped up against a memorial that's used to fetishize war after war. They should have a picture on it, my dad said, of your Uncle Jack living beside rotting corpses, pictures of doomed youth with froth-corrupted lungs. He had a first edition of Wilfred Owen. As a child, I naively wanted to boast about Jack and to tell other boys that he'd won the MC as if that would make me seem brave too. When my father overheard me once, I got a dressing down that I remember to this day. He accused me of throwing Jack's weight about. You never ask yourself, do you, why Jack never picked it up, his medal? Well, he wasn't proud of it. He was ashamed when his friends are there, six feet deep in Belgian mud. If he doesn't swank about it, why should you? When my father died, Jack invited me to go out for a meal on the first Friday of the month, every year till he died. The meals were largely silent. His bad dream was still there, even in the 1970s. His mind was still numbed by something whose origins were inexplicable, and which he'd never decoded. A war that had caused another war, like a cancer that people still seem unable to cauterize. Over the years, I'd winkle out his memories as tactfully as I could. Jack didn't mind talking about actual events, allowing himself only to recount the facts, but never touching upon his emotions. A waiter would bring the cheese trolley and most months, Jack would tell the same story about a mule cart that had arrived behind the lines ferrying an enormous cheese, a Dutch cheese, which they'd all salivated at the sight of. Jack's best friend, from the same street in Chester, impulsively ran towards it, his mouth watering, only to be picked off by a German sniper. Fell down against the cheese, Jack said. I won't eat the stuff now. And I'd nod and say, no, as understandingly as I could manage. The story was unchanging. Several times a year, a hapless waiter wheeled off the cheese trolley untouched. I ever tell you about that? Jack would ask at the end. I was sure that he half knew he had, but why not? If the fact of it never went away. As a boy, I seem to have been set the uninvited task 
of probing a world that they wished never existed and which left them wishing it would go away. My dad and my uncle were in the First World War, though it's not quite the whole story, because neither of, neither of them were exactly in it, not in the way that most people might think, but from their experiences. I was able to learn what callous folly could kill 30 million. They were forced to serve king and country for no reason. They both had lifelong scars and got nothing in return. Nothing from the king and nothing from the country. But both ended up certain there must be another way. And for that, I've been grateful to them ever since. They may or may not be in some other world now, but something is certain, if only to me, they won't be commemorating World War I and may not even think the matter worth raising. Those are the words of Hester Williams. It's an amazing story um, and we wanted to tell a bit of our father's story uh, from a different angle um, because although we grew up under the shadow of the last world war, my parents grew up under the shadow of the first world war and like many others, um, my father David Markham, who was an actor, signed the peace pledge and like many other actors too and renounced all idea of war. And, but unlike the Heathcote Williams story, you know, a different time in history, of course, when the call-ups came and everything, uh, my father very, I think, incredibly bravely said that he wasn't going to fight, but he didn't have, um, it wasn't for pacifist reasons, it wasn't for religious reasons. Um, so uh, my sister, who's a poet, Jeanne Markham, is going to come up and read you his testimony, which has never been heard, actually, before. What, what he read to the judge, and of course he went to prison for it. Um, so Jean, will you come up? This is Jean Markham. Oh. Thank you, Kika, very much. Um, yes, I'm going to read two things, actually. Before I read uh, David's statement, I wanted to read a poem. Um, this is a poem, uh, it's a childhood memory. Um, our father was very keen on fishing, and any opportunity, he would take us back to his, the town where he was born, which was Pershaw on Avon, and try to get on a, on a dinghy and uh, row up on the Avon and go fishing. And this is a, a story, sort of written, um, a poem from the eyes of myself when I was about six, and I was very afraid of deep water. And uh, um, this poem is called Inheritance. July 1955. Mummy packs the suitcase, Daddy does the drive. Daddy knows the way, so we don't need the maps. Just my sister and I on the blue leather back seat with our spy books on our laps. I could sink without a trace. Pershaw on Avon, the town where he was born, the Angel Hotel with the river and the lawn. Gladiola in a copper jug like swords crossing. Our beds have eiderdowns and matching satin. After lunch, my sister starts bossing under the quiet skin of the water. We run down to the river's edge. There's a boat upon the water that flows flat and black below the ledge. Daddy's hands look happy curled round the oars as they slip into the river's back and rise with silver claws. But keep the fear still in my face. Mummy looks dreamy, her head on one side. My sister wants to catch eels in a trap. When Daddy was a boy, he nearly died, fishing for bite with his brother, drifting too close to the weir, as I suffocate inside the youngest daughter. He pulls us in under the willows, longing for damp bread paste so he can bait up a spot. Water lilies like milk teeth just appear. The hotel garden shrinks to a dot. 
I could sink without a trace. When he turns the boat at last, he's thinking about tackle, the old shocks, his past. Standing on the lawn again, smiling with relief, I can feel the love in Daddy's hand and his grief, which I know but cannot understand. Um, the, written, the written statement that, uh, I don't know if you read it out or it was given to the judge, but we've got a very flimsy piece of uh, copied typewritten paper, quite torn and quite difficult to read, which I've, I've edited a little and, and, and written out to, uh, to read to you today. So it's headed like this, National Service Armed Forces Act 1939, application to local tribunal tribunal by a person provisionally registered in the register of conscientious objectors. Full name, Peter David Markham. Address, Pavilion Theatre, Bournemouth. In trying to give this tribunal some sort of outline of the chief influences in my life, particularly during the last ten years or so, I should like to make it clear that I'm not, so to speak, a pacifist born and bred. On the contrary, I can remember that I was something of a bully at my prep school. And although I became more pacific as I grew older, it was not until 1937 that I became genuinely convinced, a genuinely convinced pacifist and thereupon signed the peace pledge. Pacifism represented for me the return of a lost faith, the affirmation of the dignity of mankind and the hope of his ultimate brotherhood. When a state of war has been declared, all these things are in mortal danger because they are denied to a greater or lesser extent by both sides. I deny absolutely the implication of those who speak of England's part in this war as a holy crusade. The implication being that we have a monopoly over righteousness and the Germans have a monopoly over wickedness. This war between ourselves and Germany seems to me comparable to a struggle between two men in a frail canoe 100 yards above the top of Niagara Falls. This is one of the reasons why I feel I must resist the current of war itself rather than my particular adversary. That is why I place the preservation of certain values and in the coming years of sanity itself above all other claims. It may well be asked how I, as an actor, would propose to implement any of these resolutions or indeed serve the community in any way whatever. I can only reply that acting is a profession for which I am trained and equipped as for no other occupation, and that I take it seriously enough to believe that even in wartime, the theatre can perform a vitally important function, and that if I'm allowed to go on acting, I may possibly contribute something towards the happiness or enjoyment of my own people, and misery to none. David Markham, May 9th, 1940. Thanks very much for that, Sean. My name's Chris Nine, and I'm uh, Vice Chair of the Stop the War Coalition one of the people involved in uh, the launch of the No Glory campaign. And I just want to, I wanted to add my thanks to Jan and to everyone else tonight who's performed, because I think it has been a fantastic night, fittingly moving uh, and thought-provoking. And it won't be the, the only event that we hold. In fact, we will be holding a series of, it, of events um, in the new year to make sure that the kind of message that we've been promoting tonight continues to be profiled and partly that's because um, when we launched the campaign we were overwhelmed with the amount of support that we've got. Um, overnight we got literally hundreds of people signing up and I recommend you go onto the No Glory website and have a look at the breadth 
of the support for the campaign. Just off the top of my head, Michael Morpurgo signed, Anthony Gormley, Jude Law, Brian Eno, Carol Churchill, Robert Wyatt, Vivian Westwood, I could go on. It's a, as well as the hundreds, in fact thousands, of, uh, of other people who've signed up. That's a fantastic, uh, that's a fantastic start and it's something we want to uh, we want to continue. Compare it actually with the government's advisory committee which is going to be organising their commemorations which is made up of uh, amongst not many other people five uh, ex uh, senior officers from the army and navy and the air force one ex minister of defence and a PR consultant so I think you can see the direction uh, that one's going in um, and I think that also shows the extent to which actually their approach and their argument is isolated in broader society and our job is to make sure through, 19, through sorry, 2014 next year that they continue to be isolated and that our message of the reality and the horror of the war is the one that dominates proceedings. So I want to introduce now uh, our next and final performer, he's someone, one of the people we're most pleased actually to have on board with the campaign, uh, a radical voice, uh, a brilliant musician, the cultural conscience of the nation, please give a big, warm round of applause to Billy Bragg. That's very kind, thank you. Singer-songwriter from Barking in Essex would have done actually, but thank you for the <laughs> cultural conscience bit. Thanks. Last night I had the strangest dream I ever dreamed before. songs about the First World War than Eric Bogle, a Scottish songwriter who lived most of his life in Australia. He wrote a song you may be familiar with from the Pogues called The Band Played Waltz in Matilda. He wrote another great song uh, called The Greenfields of France that was recorded by the men they couldn't hang. And I'm going to play another one of his songs, uh, perhaps a lesser known uh, song of his. It doesn't really come from the First World War but, but could have. It's one of those uh, great anti-war songs I think. My youngest son came home today. My youngest son came home 
times a day His friends marched with him all the way The fife and drum beat out the time While in his box of polished pine Like dead meat on a butcher's tray My youngest son came home today My youngest son was a fine young man With a wife, a daughter and two sons and a man he would have lived and died Till by a bullet sanctified Now he's a saint, or so they say They brought their young saint home today Irish sky looks down and weeps Upon the narrow Belfast streets The children's blood in gutters spilled In dreams of glory unfulfilled As part of freedom Price to pay. My youngest son came home today. My youngest son came home today. His friends marched with him all the way. The pipe and drum beat out the time While in his box of polished pine Like dead meat on a butcher's tray My youngest son came home today This time he's here to stay Thank you. Fighting the grey eyes, fighting the tears Armed for the teeth, for a war of words Reaching all the years I advanced across a puppy field I saw the gleam as you raised your shield and love Screamed down with the sun behind its back Our fathers were all soldiers Should we be soldiers too? Fighting and falling like soldiers do Tactical, unclear war And I can't be bothered to find out What we were fighting for No one can win this war of the senses 
I see no reason to drop my defenses Stand fast, my emotions rally round my shaking heart Our fathers were soldiers Should we be soldiers too? Fighting, falling like soldiers do Some of us carrying weapons Some of us praying Each of us trying to work out what the other is saying But the secrets are out of the box And the hopes of the ages are dashed on the rocks And I sleep with one eye open Waiting for the dawn Our fathers rule soldiers should we be soldiers too? Fighting, falling like soldiers do Our fathers were all soldiers Should we be soldiers too? Fighting, falling like soldiers Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't. That's, that's one of my songs. I don't actually have any songs that specifically refer to the First World War. But um, I was looking through a, a book of uh, war poetry. Amazing how different the war poetry from the First World War compared to the Second World War is. Uh, but I came across this poem by Thomas Hardy. And uh, it, it was one of those poems that looked eminently singable. So I'm going to see if I can sing it for you now. <clears throat> it's called The Man He Killed. If he and I had met beside some old and ancient inn, we would have set us down to wet many a napkin. But we were ranged as infantry and staring face to face. I shot at him as he at me and killed him in his place. I shot him dead because, because, because he was my foe. Just so he was my foe, that's true, it's clear enough, although he thought that he'd enlist perhaps offhand like just as I was out of work and sold his traps no other reason why how quaint and curious is war you shoot a fella down that you would treat in any bar or help to half a crown but we were ranged as infantry and staring face to face. I shot at him as he at me 
and killed him in his place. I'm old enough to, uh, to remember veterans of the First World War. I used to run errands for a guy who was a neighbour of my parents, embarking a guy named Will Vernon. He was a lovely old guy. He'd been a scoutmaster, but um, he'd also been gassed on the Somme. And uh, if the weather was a bit dampish as it was, we lived by the river, by the Thames embarking, and uh, some nights, the fog would come up from the river and hang around you in those days. And on those days, Will Vernon found it difficult to breathe. He, he coughed a cough as wet as uh, an October day. And uh, sometimes talking to him, when he was trying to tell me what he wanted from the shops, it was like talking to a drowned man, like a drowned man. And you know, I knew I'm that age also that I knew a lot of the men down our street, I knew them by what they'd done in the Second World War. You know, my father used to say to me, don't play football up against that guy at the end street, that old Polish guy, he was in the resistance, you know, he'll come out and, you know, cut your throat. They, used to, they stopped us kicking our football against these gable end lords here. <laughs> and old Fred Bacon over the road had been on submarines, you never know what he might do. He didn't play knocking down the ginger on his door either. But never anybody said anything vaguely humorous about Will Vernon. And when I said to my dad, I must ask on Mr. Vernon what he did in the war, my dad said, it's best you don't do that, son. It's best you don't do that. And a couple of years ago, through the wonder of the internet, I found out what happened to Will Vernon. He was an 18 year old recruit. He was on the Somme in the last month of the war. He was gassed. He didn't really see any fighting, I don't think. He was gassed and invalided out. And uh, his uh, life, just as Ethicott Williams, uh, referred, I was thinking of Will Vernon as I was listening to that uh, beautiful piece by Ethcott Williams about his dad and his uncle. And uh, he, was a, uh, he was a lovely bloke, old Will Vernon. Draftsman, build me a path from 
cradle to grave and I'll give my consent to any government that does not deny a man a living wage go find the young men never to fight again bring up the banners from the days gone by sweet moderation hearts of this nation deserts us not we are between the walls thank you very much The singer-songwriter from Barking is back. He's going to do another one. Billy, thank you so much. Before he does, please give a big thank you to everyone who's performed tonight. Absolutely phenomenal. All of them. Sign up to look on our website, noglory.org. And next year, we're going to have one humongous big event at the Barbican. Because we are going to get a message across that there is a different story about war. There is a way of looking for peace, not war. So, the singer-songwriter from Barking, who does such great poems from Dorset, from Thomas Hardy, Billy Bragg, thank you so much, thank Billy. You. Thank you, Jeremy, thank you. And thanks very much, everyone, tonight, for coming along. And uh, it's just such, the acoustics in here are just so great, aren't they? When I think of the, some of the tin boxes I play in my profession, and you look at a place like this and the acoustics, but, but you know, this wasn't just built for a person to sing, this was built for the community to sing. So maybe we should sing together for the end of the evening. Let's see what we sing together. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Come on. Where have all the flowers gone? A long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls pick them every one When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? Come on everyone, come on, come on, come on Come on, come on, here, come on Where have all the young girls gone? Long time passing Where have all the young girls gone a long time ago? Where have all the young girls gone? Gone to young men, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they Everyone, when will they?
graveyards gone We'll have all the graveyards gone Long time passing We'll have all the graveyards gone A long time ago We have all the graveyards gone Gone to flower everyone When will they